we certainly want to thank the panel for their very thoughtful remarks. Um, they've certainly given the commissioners a lot to think about. And I will turn to the commissioners in a few seconds uh, for their questions for the panelists. However, we would like you to participate as well. Those of you in the audience, if you would like to ask a question, there is an index card in your folders. Um, if you write your question on the card, you can raise your hand with the question written on it. Staff will pick up the question and will bring them uh, to me. Um, for those of you watching via the webcast, you can also submit your questions online. So there's, there are opportunities for all of us to be involved, even though I'm not sure we'll get to all of the questions this morning in the limited time that we have. So, commissioners, uh, what questions do you have uh, for the panel? Yes. Alice? This was a terrific set of presentations, and uh, uh, I thank all of the panelists. As I was listening to it, and we're here a stone's throw from the capital of the United States, uh, I was wondering about what is the locus of leadership and action uh, that could translate some of these things into actual policy. Uh, we had two examples of things that started basically as public-private partnerships or with philanthropy and have moved to the state level, uh, Nebraska and uh, Minnesota. Uh, that's one possibility. Uh, <coughs> there are others. What, what do some of the panelists think of as uh, what the model for getting things done is, and does it involve the federal government? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, Alice Rivlin was vice chair of the Federal Reserve when, uh, under my tenure, so I am well aware of um, her ability to ask tough questions. <laughs> uh, you know, my experience is um, if you go to the education community, you go to the health community, people get this. This, this is, is not a revelation, but that's not what moves the ball politically. Um, in Minnesota, we've had an awful lot of success when we engage the business community. Now, you've got to market to them. You've got to translate the research. You, it's got to be measurable. It's got to be transparent, and you've got to kind of stay into it long term. But it was clear that once we... Um, we got the business community on board, and as I mentioned through the Early Learning Foundation, we were able to move this politically. So, for example, state of Minnesota, with a lot of lobbying effort, uh, we, we ended up um, with, again, the support of the business community, hiring a, um, a media consultant firm, and we created something called Minnesota Mini Mines, Minnesota Mines, and we literally lobbied hard. They were seven days a week, 24 hours a day. I've never seen anything like this. And we were able uh, this year to get a $40 million commitment to start expanding our scholarship mentor program in a number of uh, very at-risk communities throughout the state, including a um, uh, Native American tribe up, up north. So I don't think we would have come close. Uh, we've been at this for about 10 years. I don't think we would have come close to this kind of result without the strong support of a business community that doesn't have the two-year, four-year uh, four political horizon these CEOs are in it for the long term. They need a safe community, a well-educated community. They kind of get it. And uh, once they saw the economic returns, that's what moved it politically. And as I travel around the country on this issue, it's pretty clear to me that in most states, if you don't get the business community involved, you're not going to move very far. And I want to concur with what Art is saying. We, when I referenced credible voices um, as well as unusual voices, Credible voices are voices of people like Jack Shonkoff and James Heckman who, who can really independently translate what the science is saying. But the unusual voices, and, and, and Art, I'm not saying you're an unusual person, <laughs> but, I think one, uh, but I do think one of the things that moves us forward uh, exponentially in this field was the voice of the economist. And now we're hearing voices of police chiefs and sheriffs who are saying, I'm arresting um, the children of the parents I arrested 15 years ago. And we're hearing from the, the school principals and superintendents who are saying, uh, when these children start school behind, we just have an uphill battle 
um, that we often are not successful in winning. And now when we hear from uh, retired military voices saying it's about our economic and not only our economic but our national security. Um, and um, one of the latest groups is the evangelical groups that have been um, marshaled around appreciating um, um, many of the values that they have around families and around children being successful uh, are resonating with them. So it really as somebody who comes from the field of early childhood practice, um, our voices tend to be seen as you're protecting your field, or you're, you're advocating for your field, but when it's the voices of the community that are saying, wow, no matter how you look at this, this is part <coughs> of the solution. They are the ones that um, make things happen. So I'll add one other point. I, I think in many areas there are lots of examples of where um, things that happen at the federal level um, are catalyzed by what people do at a state or local level that then becomes a prototype or a model. So for me, the, 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 the critical need in the field is to identify and then provide resources for those communities and those states that want to be the innovators, that want to basically try new things. Because many places um, are, will say, um, you know, we want to know what the state of the art is and we want to do that. And others will say, I've had those conversations, when you find out the new stuff, tell me what you found out and we want to do it here, but we don't want to be the laboratory. But there are places, and particularly some places that are actually wonderful examples of state of the art, who when you talk to them say, we know we're among the best around, we know we're thought of really well, but you know we're not satisfied with what we're accomplishing, especially for the most disadvantaged families and children we're serving. So in this case, I think, um, the federal government's role, um, uh, even notwithstanding all the difficulties right now at the federal level, um, is unlikely to be where the innovation will be generated. Um, but we need places that want to be leaders at the community and state level that are willing to take risks and create an environment um, in which new, new things will be learned. And um, Alice, I would just add for you that um, one of the earliest and biggest investors, I mean multi-million dollar investor in our work and building our work was HUD. Mm. Um, we're actually getting funded through the Moving to Work platform of HUD and it, and it jumped in early, a year and a half into the sort of the outcomes we were getting. HUD paid to replicate our program on a multi-year basis and we've had subsequent housing contracts funding interventions and capacity building interventions with families as a way of decreasing dependence on housing subsidy and uh, preventing homelessness. Okay, I have a number of questions from commissioners, so I'll ask the panel, I want to get as many questions in as possible to be as brief as possible in, in your responses. I have Governor Daniels, Katie Haycock, Sheila Burke, Angela Glover, Blackwood. So Governor Daniels, read. Yeah, thanks. Well, first, I, I think we all admire an, immensely the uh, commitment of the uh, panelists, the, the presenters, and their passion, and no doubt they're saving a number of lives uh, uh, every day, uh, young lives, and we appreciate it. Also, very commendable, the constant references to data and evidence based this and that. But that just made it to me all the more curious that um, there wasn't a single mention of the single biggest driver of every heartbreaking phenomenon we talk about, health status, poverty, stress, poor educational outcomes, and that's marital status. It's the single clearest fact in social science, and it has been for decades. I can't believe there's anybody in the room who disputes it. And you know, it's, it's as though we were gathered to discuss mortality in the Middle Ages and the plague never came up. So I'm just wondering, in all these programs we hear about, if anything can be said about efforts as a part of these very laudable activities to encourage family formation, two-parent family formation, or at least, and, or to discourage uh, embarking uh, further on life and, parent, and parenting in the absence of a, of a partner who can do more than anything else to help uh, that family stay out of poverty and, and, and so forth. I mean, Risa had some good things to say about things that are simple but difficult. Okay, I know this is difficult. Um, but it's exactly, the irony is, it's exactly like the healthcare system. It's, we shower all this attention and money on the 
on the symptoms and avoid the prevention too, all too often. And so, you know, we don't say obesity is a fact of life and it's really hard, so, and by the way, it's okay. Now it's just, we're, now just treat the diabetes. So I was just hoping sooner or later there'd be a word or two and I thought maybe I could elicit it if I asked that question. Okay, mm -hmm. analysts. I, I've got, there, there's no data research, at least that I've seen on this, that it's been convincing one way or the other. It's never clear to me what the exact policy recommendation would be. I will say this, though, as uh, we started to develop our programs in Minnesota, and this is a, a program that's out in the western suburbs of Minnesota. They're fairly wealthy, but pockets of poverty. And this, the, some of the scholarship families would come and, and talk about their experience and what the scholarship meant to them. And in this one particular case, it was a two-parent family that was in fairly difficult trouble. The kids, the, both parents had lost their jobs. They were under a lot of stress. And it turned out to be a mentor. Uh, I don't know if it was a parent as teacher mentor, but it was a mentor um, that helped this family. And then they got the scholarship. And it significantly, re you could tell, I mean, they were talking about how it reduced the stress in the family. And that, six, that family now is succeeding. And as both the mom and dad were talking about, they said without this program, without the mentoring, and without the scholarship support, they wouldn't be a family today. So I'm, I think it is, it is a critical issue. Of course, the, the more adults with a child, the better. Uh, the more loving adults, we know that. Uh, the public policy implications there are not so clear to me um, uh, where we go with this. I think one of the reasons we have seen such an increase in poverty in this country over the last 30 years is because of so many single parent families, so many teenagers um, that have children way too early. Um, I'm not sure where we begin on that issue. I'm, I'm not seeing the intervention that makes a difference. So I'll just offer one point on that. I, well, two quick things. One is that that single parent status is clearly one of those risk factors for poor outcomes, as are uh, exposure to violence, substance abuse, depression, poverty, and the data are overwhelmingly clear that it's the pile up of the cumulative factors rather than any one. Having said that, um, I think, Governor Daniels, you're really addressing a very important point about how, and I would relate that to some of the comments I made about the need to think about how to build the capabilities of the adults who are in children's lives because uh, there's a whole lot of recent data that's come out now to indicate that actually single parent families or unmarried parents are different from the fact that most of those families actually have fathers involved. Uh, it may be a different father at different times. There may be more transient relationships, but um, there's actually more than one adult involved with children in many of these families than we've been led to believe. And I think once again, the issue would be short of having a law that requires people to get married is, or requires them to not be poor or requires them to not be depressed, is to basically say, in the meantime, what could we do? What could we do to strengthen those capabilities, whether people get married or not? And I think you're identifying a very important point of how we could be more creative about engaging more adults in the lives of their children, um, independent of this problem of single parenthood. Okay, Katie Haycock. Jack, this question is, is for you. Um, I'm very much intrigued by your suggestion that policy sort of demanding outcomes for programs can get in the way of the kind of experimentation and learning uh, that, you're, uh, that is so important to mo moving our knowledge forward. But I'm betting you would also agree that going back to the days when we didn't look at evidence and looked only at number of people served and how, how many dollars were spent is not a good alternative. So talk a little bit about, if you will, about what is, what is the, the right direction for policy that keeps us moving forward but, not, uh, but, but moving forward in both outcomes and in our understanding. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that question because I am like a maniac about outcomes. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I, in, in fact, uh, what I, I am I, too, I, which is why I asked. I, can't, <laughs> I mean, I can't stand. I think we can't tolerate anymore people saying, "Well, you know, we just know it works," even though it hasn't been measured. I think outcomes are critical. My point was only to say that we have to build into the system some part of it that's trying things that haven't yet been demonstrated to work. So, I mean, there's no successful business anywhere that doesn't have some part of its operation trying to think about where it's going to go next while it's working on 
delivering its primary product very well. Uh, biomedical research is the classic example. I, we often use the model of, a, of, a, of acute lymphocytic leukemia in children, which at the time that Head Start was established, that disease had a 99% mortality rate. And today, that disease has about a 2% mortality rate. And that happened not because people said at the beginning, we're only going to use the treatment that we have evidence for. At any given time, we use for everybody the treatment we have evidence for, but there's some small group in the back room and some experimentation that tries new things. And along the way, some things made kids sicker. Some things actually made children die sooner. But we kept pushing further until we got to the point where it was effective. And that's my only point. I think outcomes are critical. I think accountability is essential. But we have to create some space to try new things and allow failure to present learning opportunities. Thank Mark, you. you had a quick response? Hey, just a quick response, and, and Jack makes such a critical point about the need for innovation. So one of the reasons economists like markets, uh, and I call our approach a market-based approach, is our providers have to compete for these parents. And the more innovative and creative they are in working with at-risk families, the more parents are going to go to those programs. Um, so I'm going to argue that uh, with the right incentives, and that is these, these scholarships are well-funded, there's a big incentive for these programs to be good because they won't get the scholarships if they're not forced to rated, and to innovate because that's the way markets work. So I'm not saying there aren't other ways to innovate, and I would like to see a whole lot of money going for research, but recognize that if we ch get the, the incentives right and get that market working for us, we are going to see innovation in, in early ed because they're going to want, they have to attract these parents. Let's all agree that parent um, satisfaction is not a good outcome anymore. That, that usually means we couldn't find anything else that changed that, but people liked the program. I mean, I think we have to move beyond that. All right, the next question is from Commissioner Sheila Burke. Uh, this is both for um, Arthur as well as Jack. Um, Arthur, you um, mentioned four elements to uh, the, the Perry Project uh, as being critical. One were the scholarships, one were the home mentors, the rating of the programs, and the focus on uh, very low-income children. And I wonder if you were to look at those four elements equally, which of them you believe to be the most critical in terms of success? Uh, and then sort of uh, <coughs> moving to the point that Jack made, um, I'm also interested in understanding what failed and why. Um, we have uh, had a terrific opportunity this morning to hear about a number of uh, interventions that have been quite successful and had terrific returns, and I would underscore uh, the value of uh, understanding those outcomes and measuring those outcomes. But I'm also interested in understanding what didn't work and what if we were to guide people away from certain kinds of interventions that have been found consistently to be at odds with what our long-term strategies are, what those might be. Well, I had said at early on um, parent engagement and empowerment is critical to get the long-term benefits we're talking about, and I think you have to start prenatal. Um, I, I think for a whole lot of health reasons you should start prenatal, but I also think that bonding that goes on between the mentor and the parent is critical. Getting the skills that Jack talks about for these parents critical at the very beginning. Um, so parent engagement and power is, is, is I would say, is a, must be a critical component. If you just take the child from the family, put them in a center-based program, without that parent engagement, just not going to work the way the research suggests it will work. As far as failures, um, again, not engaging the parents, and the quality of the teachers. I think one of the problems with Head Start is it started as an anti-poverty program, so they often hired the parents and trained the parents to be the teachers, and I think that's why they're not getting the kind of results we, we saw in Perry and some other programs. So uh, quality teachers, small classroom size are also critical. If you fail to do that, if you fail to get that kind of quality, you're not going to get these kind of results. Yeah, so I, I think on the failure side, clearly the big one for the whole field has always been taking a demonstration project that showed good impacts, and then when you scale it, um, really not following the fidelity of what was effective, and the biggest villain has been people with less skills being asked to do more um, with less. And that, I mean, I'm, I'm not an economist, but from my point of view, that's probably the biggest waste of money is, is putting a little bit of money to something that overwhelms everybody, and, and um, I don't see the value in that. I will say something about parent engagement. We have a meta-analytic database that we've been building that's almost completed, and we looked at this issue, and I have an interesting finding. Well, maybe it's not an interesting finding to some people, but we found that programs, uh, these were center-based programs, center-based early education programs from birth up to school age. Um, 
So programs that had parent engagement as defined rather loosely and mostly involved just kind of casual support and giving people information, for the more disadvantaged part of the population added no additional benefit. Programs that had active parent involvement with skill building and coaching doubled the impact on children's achievement uh, scores and cognitive measures. So once again, I think we need a degree of specificity about what it is we're talking about. And uh, all of the studies always come back to the point that it's the training and the quality of the staff matched to what they're asked to deal with. So people with less training could do a great job with kind of single, so socially isolated, inexperienced parents. But people with less training cannot help uh, folks with serious uh, depression, substance abuse, dealing with intimate partner violence. That's that your grandmother could have told you that, and, and the science reinforces that finding. I just want to add one other thing, which is a variation of this theme, and that is that uh, if we think any, anybody has come up with the answer and we need to ask no more questions or do more investigation, that's a recipe for failure. And so I would say in our own educator experience over the last 10 years, uh, we don't describe them as failures, but we have described them as moments of learning that have taken us to a, a, a new level of, of doing um, the work, not only with the children, but with the families. Another thing and we could I learn from the innovation world, they have this concept of fail fast as opposed to fail slowly. <laughs> and we could, we could do well by taking that into account. I'd like to add that with the families that, that we serve, we see evidence of failures all the time. And the failures are failures of programs that ostensibly were successful. So they got finished with a job training program that lasted two or three weeks, that then failed to connect the family to the job, or they failed to succeed in the job, or the parenting programs that uh, were successful in communicating the curriculum, but then failed to change the dynamics in the home. And we think of these failures as, as simply something where resources might have been wasted. But what I see them as, what my staff see them as, is places where families are worse off than they were before. The money has been spent and the family is hurt by it because they have failed to accomplish something they expected they should be able to do and thereby have less faith in themselves to engage again in the future. And that, that's damaging, and we have to look at that in the programs that we're designing and their impact. Okay, the next question is from Commissioner Angela Glover-Blackwell. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a terrific panel. Uh, my questions have to do with quality. It is so clear from all of your presentations that the children we're concerned about need the highest quality programs we can possibly provide. And I'm wondering how through policy we ensure that high quality. Uh, Art, I appreciate your model and its reliance on creating the market to produce its best, but all of us have seen stunning market failures, particularly for the communities that we care most about. And so while I can see the process that you propose, it doesn't convince me of that that is the way to produce quality across the board. So I'd like to hear more about how we produce quality across the board. And the other thing that's come out from this conversation that's so important is to provide this high quality early childhood education in a context that produces triple, quadruple bottom lines, the protective system that Jack talked about. How do we make sure that if we have growing acceptance that we can and should do that, that that doesn't reduce the quality by diluting the attention and having the program become more about that than about the high quality early childhood education? So let me give you um, so a real world experience. With the Minnesota Early Learning Foundation, we were fairly generous with our scholarships paying up to 13000 a year. And what happened in this community in St. Paul is a brand new facility opened up uh, by an organization called New Horizon, uh, right on a bus line, very high quality program. They got filled almost immediately. Montessori started to expand their program in this low income community. A bunch of faith based groups started to expand their program. And then as we, as the word is getting out, because we're using this parent aware system around the state, what we're finding, and we're getting all this feedback, all of a sudden providers who never thought about quality, now they realize that if they're going to be part of this system, they have to improve their quality. So through Twin Cities United Way and other nonprofit organizations, we're starting to fund programs that want to improve their, 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 their quality. And sort of has been suggested by this panel, we have to help these, we have to get, build skills 
that the, provi that the providers have. We have to improve our providers if they're going to improve their programs and improve our parent outcomes. So if the scholarships are priced generously, there's a big incentive to improve quality. And the word is out there now. So we're able to show now um, over the last four or five years how many programs, and it's a significant number, it's over 100, that have now moved into that four-star rating system that were, when we first looked at them, were well below that. So we're starting to see it. And of course, that benefits all children. Across the state, it's benefiting all children. But most importantly, we're the, the at-risk communities. They're starting to see, which they never saw before, brand new, high quality, early ed programs creating jobs. And I'm going to argue that's the kind of economic development that's sustainable and we will build that community. And I think there are a couple of things in terms of policy development. There is a great temptation to provide a little bit of money for everybody as opposed to put the money into quality programs and that may mean serving fewer children. And I think, I think many states have fallen into that and the, and the problem of doing that is it's very hard to then add the expectations around quality after the fact. The, the, the point is quality does cost and uh, I think uh, policy decisions need to, um, to recognize that and say if we're going to make a difference it's going to be with a quality program and that's what we're going to put our resources into. I think the other thing is um, um, thinking about where the children of low income are and going to those places and developing strategies that enhance the quality of those programs as opposed to thinking that it's all about um, I think the risk of some of our quality rating systems is that um, it doesn't do what art does. It, in fact, just um, uh, makes it clear to somebody of low income that they're walking into a two-star program every day instead of a five-star program every day. You have to have these deliberate strategies that go where the children and families are and enhance the quality of those programs, whether it's a coaching strategy or it's your incentive through the scholarships. Um, but it, it, it does take a concerted effort to really think about quality being a priority in your policy development. We are badly running out of time, and I haven't been able to get to any of the questions that have come to me from the Internet uh, or any of the questions from the audience and all of the commissioner questions. So what I'm going to do is ask each of the three commissioners who have questions to ask your questions now, one after the other, and then I will give the panel <laughs> a minute to respond to the three questions, so at least we got the issues on the table. And we'll go in this order, Commissioner Reed Thompson, Curie, and Rebecca Oney. So uh, maybe they could, uh, instead of just even answering mine now, just if they could submit it, online, you know, submit it to us in writing or whatever. <clears throat> My question goes back to this Head Start issue. Um, and I'd like the specific recommendation from, from them on what are we to do with this resource? Are they saying that this is such an, you know, is it a failure? Throw it away. Are there lessons that we're supposed to learn? Are we supposed to scale it? Are we supposed to modify it, reconfigure it? But I, need, I think we need to have some kind of specificity. What do we do with all of this infrastructure that's sitting there? And if they could just sort of give that to us uh, later for our consideration, I sure would appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. There's some overlap here. Um, it's related. We were talking quality, and Reed was just talking about a, a, a largely scaled program. So I am questioning spreadability and scalability and how we address that. Because you, you clearly demonstrated local, great leadership, partnerships, relationships. But how do you scale something like that? Rebecca? Uh, also relatedly, if the panel could reflect on the question around what the economics are of scaling high quality early childhood interventions um, with respect to a few dimensions. So one is, you know, of course, which sectors are we drawing upon to, um, to finance this? And um, in some ways, to, to Reed's point, but going somewhat beyond that, are there specific sources of funding that are currently available not just in the early childhood space, but you know, looking to health and, um, and affordable housing or other sources of funding that you would specifically suggest that we repurpose in order to finance the scale of these interventions. Um, and then just with a, with a final point to, to Jack's uh, reflections on the impact of early childhood interventions on health, are there specific health care uh, system resources, especially from a financial perspective, that you would recommend be deployed for this purpose? 
Okay, and this is the impossible task panel. Um, you've got 30 seconds <laughs> each to respond to the questions here's a, here's that were a quick raised. 30 second response. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Head Start in, in Minnesota, they have to compete. They have to compete with Montessori, they have to compete with New Horizon, they have to be, compete with the faith based groups. If they can't compete, they don't get the parents, and that's it. So we don't necessarily, we, we have some terrific Head Starts, and we have some that clearly aren't the quality. On scalability, give us five years. We plan on scaling this up in Minnesota and showing it can be done. We plan on having every poverty child in the state of Minnesota in perpetuity uh, with scholarships and, and mentors. Um, and we are in the process of scaling that up. So give us a few years and we'll show you we can do it. Uh, economics, where do you get the financing? So I've, I've argued this is economic development. We have a huge economic development. I want to take that 250 million we gave to the Mall of America and switch it over to this program. If you give me that economic development budget, I'll get you a better economic return, it's better for the economy, and it'll really get results, and it will finance this program. Quickly, anyone else from the panel have we a quick response? We should keep Head Start. We should um, take it to the new level of practice that we are learning from the field about what's effective. Um, scaling is about drilling down about which practices are most effective and how do we take them to the broader community. In terms of the economics of, of, of scaling high quality and looking at existing resources, I think there are multiple ones. We can look at where are the savings by investing in quality programs and how can we rearrange those dollars um, to prevent things from happening in the first place. And Jackie, you have the final word. I think word. we should try to stop tri squeezing one more drop of blood out of the Perry Preschool Project. Uh, I think we've gotten out of what we can get. I, my sense is that, that we, have, we have this rapidly growing science that has been used largely to build public will and understanding of why early childhood is important. It's time to start using some of that science to think about how we can be smarter and more precise and more effective in what we might do in terms of building on the best of what we have now and take things to another place. We need a whole new field here. Thank you. Please join me in saying a big thank you to this panel.